Hello, my friends. It's Dr. Sharon with Clinic Reviews. Today, I'm going to be talking about basic nutrition. You know, when I talk to people who failed NCLEX at maximum questions, I always say to them, you almost passed. You failed by this much, just this little bitty much. And you know what they probably failed with? Fundamentals. And basic nutrition is a part of fundamentals. You learn about basic nutrition back in the early part of your program, and you've forgotten some of it by now because we don't do a lot of nutrition teaching in the hospital. The dietitians do the nutrition teaching. We don't do a lot of it. So there are some things you really have to know about nutrition before you take the NCLEX or any of your standardized tests. So why don't you go ahead and watch this? We'll get started right after this. Hello, Clinic Review family. It's Dr. Sharon with Clinic Reviews. Today, we're going to be continuing on with the blue book. You can see the blue book there behind me over my right shoulder. I don't know if that's your right. I think it's your left. So um, it's under basic nutrition, and it really is fundamentals of nutrition. Doesn't get more basic than what we're going to talk about today. So you're not going to find these questions to be particularly difficult but these are things that we don't talk about a lot. And so you may be forgetting them very easily. So we're going to, we're going to talk about them and we're, or, or we're going to test you on them, go over questions. You may feel there's a little bit of redundancy here, but that's in order for you to really be able to retain this information in your mind. And if you're watching this like six months before you take the NCLEX, watch it again, right before you take the NCLEX so that you know this information. Okay. Now, you know, this YouTube channel is part of the Greater Clinic Review Organization, which offers a phenomenal NCLEX review. It's taught by Mark Klimek, the GOAT himself, who, as of 2024, is still alive. In fact, he's still traveling around with his wife and friends. He's sort of retired, but he's still doing some of his NCLEX review. We also offer small group tutoring. It comes as a monthly package that you can purchase it. And we also have a streaming service where a lot of the videos that we have, including those here on our YouTube channel are available to you for a small monthly fee and you can get them with no commercials. So go to clinicreviews.com to find all that information. And you can also find it below in the information about this video. All right, let's go ahead and get started. You know that the blue book provides basic information. So the blue book is all about facts. That's what the blue book is. And you can find it under blue book, the blue book by Mark Klimek on Amazon. You can also get the app if you go to clinicreviews.com, but it's just facts, but there are no NCLEX style questions that go along with it. So I write questions so that you can practice the knowledge that you've gained by going through the blue book with these questions. A nurse is educating a client about essential nutrients, which of the following is considered an essential nutrient. Caffeine, cholesterol, vitamin C, or alcohol? Well, I hope you're able to guess that correctly in vitamin C. So here are the five essential nutrients, carbohydrates, fats, proteins, vitamins, and minerals. Those are the, the essential nutrients. I'll say them again, carbohydrates, proteins, fats, vitamins, and minerals. And the only three things that provide calories, in other words, the only three things that provide energy are the first three. When calculating the caloric intake from macronutrients, macronutrients are carbohydrates, fats, and proteins, how many calories per gram does protein provide? All right, it is four calories, four calories per gram. So if you look at look at some of the, the, um, the nutrition information, you can pick up anything, a can of soup, a, a box of crackers, uh, anything you want to. Pick up anything that's in your cupboard, Look at the nutrition information, see how many calories are provided by various things. You can divide any proteins that provide calories, divide it by four, and it should tell you how many grams. Or if it tells you there's nine grams of protein, then you can multiply nine times four, and that means you get 36 calories from that, that item. So carbohydrates offer four as well. So proteins and carbs offer both offer four, fats offers nine. The body can burn carbohydrates easier than anything else. So the body prefers to burn carbohydrates because it requires the least amount of oxygen. But if someone is carb low on carbs, we store carbohydrates in our skeletal muscle. If someone's low on carbohydrates, 
they can start to burn fat, they can start to burn protein. Someone who's starving will start to burn fat and protein, and they do start to lose muscle mass for someone who's starving. The most concentrated source of energy in the body is found in concentrated. That means per gram, how many calories per gram. So this is also testing whether you understand vocabulary. So concentrated means per gram, they're most calories. And I told you fats provide nine calories per gram. Carbohydrates provide four calories per gram and proteins provide four calories per gram. So the most concentrated is fat. The nurse educates a client on glycogen. So glycogen is not something we ingest. Glycogen is something that's actually takes in carbohydrates and the liver makes glycogen and it stores it in the liver and in the muscles. So when I say that you store carbohydrates in your muscles, it's stored in the form of glycogen. We don't really eat glycogen. Our body takes it and produces it. When educating a client about lactose intolerance, the nurse explains that lactose is primarily found in what? So lactose is a carbohydrate. Sucrose is a carbohydrate. Glucose is a carbohydrate. Lactose is a carbohydrate. So carbohydrates are all these oses, right? And lactose, when people who are lactose intolerant, is found in dairy products. So milk, cottage cheese, and so forth. Sucrose, Okay, so sucrose, where is that found primarily? Sucrose is found primarily in fruits and vegetables. A nurse is teaching a client about fat-soluble vitamins. Which of the following vitamins are fat-soluble? This is to teach you that if the entire answer isn't correct, then the answer isn't correct. You don't pick an answer that is half correct. A, D, E, and K. A, D, E, K, A, D, E, K. You should know those. Every nurse knows A, D, E, and K are fat-soluble. That's why we don't want you to overdose on A, D, E, and K because they can be stored in the fat. You can actually uh, overdose on those. All the other vitamins are water soluble, which means if you take in too much, it's going to be excreted in the urine, but A, D, and K can overdose on those. So you have to pick an answer that has only fat soluble. So the one that has only fat soluble in it is B, vitamin A and vitamin D. Which of the following is a function of vitamin D? aids in iron absorption, promotes blood clotting, enhances calcium absorption, or stimulates red blood cell production. The reason I want you to know this is because I find that there's a lot of people, nursing, prospective nurses particularly, who don't know that vitamin D is important for calcium absorption. So if someone has a low calcium or low bone density, and we tell them you need to increase your calcium, they also need to increase vitamin D. What's a natural way to get vitamin D? Sunlight is a natural way to get vitamin D. So someone who's hardly ever out in the sun, encourage them to spend more time out in the sun. It doesn't mean they can wear sunscreen. They can wear a, a, a hat. They can wear a long sleeve shirt. All that's fine, but they need to just spend more time outside and they will absorb more vitamin D. Uh, and it is important in calcium production. A nurse is caring for a client with a vitamin K deficiency. The nurse understands that vitamin K is important for what? Vision, skin integrity, neurologic functioning, or blood clotting. So did you, I hope you know that vitamin K is the antidote for warfarin overdose. And vitamin K, and remember warfarin, prevents clotting, prevents clotting. So if you give someone vitamin K, you reverse the effect of Warfarin. So I hope you know that vitamin K is essential for blood clotting. I'm not talking about potassium. Potassium is K. Okay. Vitamin K is a vitamin. Potassium is a mineral. Minerals are all those electrolytes in our body. So iron is a mineral um, and other, other things that are not vitamins are minerals. The nurse knows that magnesium is important for which of the following. So magnesium, what is that? Is that a vitamin or a mineral? Well, it's not a vitamin because if it was a vitamin, it would have the word vitamin in front of it, okay? So it's got to be a mineral. So what is important? And the reason I want you to know this is because it's important for nerve transmission and muscle contraction. Now, calcium is also important for nerve transmission and muscle contraction. Calcium is also important for bone formation. But the two minerals or electrolytes that are really important for nerve transmission and muscle contraction are calcium and magnesium. 
Okay. So if they say your patient has hyporeflexia, hyporeflexia, their reflexes are not as um, active as you would expect them to be. And it says, which electrolyte do you want to, you want to measure or look at? You should choose either calcium or magnesium. Okay. Um, have you ever heard of Chavostex sign? Chavostex sign is when you tap in front of the ear and the cheek tremors. Okay. That's a, a nerve problem. Okay. Your nerves are hyper reflexic, right? Cause you have Chavostex sign. You need to have, and it says, what electrolyte do you want to measure? You want to measure calcium or magnesium because these are important for nerve transmission and muscle contraction. When teaching a client about protein, the nurse explains that proteins are essential for which bodily function, energy storage, growth and tissue repair, fat storage, or water balance. So protein is really important for growth and tissue repair. That's why people who are starving and they end up um, using all their stored proteins will start to have growth issues. They'll lose their muscle mass. Um, they'll have a lot of different problems. A nurse is educating. All right, now we're going to talk about BMI. The rest of the questions are about BMI. It's not difficult, but it's easy to forget these, um, these scales. And so I'm just going to give you like 10 questions to practice remembering them. Okay. The nurse is educating a client on BMI. Which of the following is the normal BMI range for adults? Normal. 15 to 18.4, 18.5 to 24.9, 25 to 29.9, or 30.0 to 34.9. So the answer is 18.5 to 24.9. Y'all BMI is as fundamental as you can possibly get. Teaching someone normal weight ranges is as fundamental as you're going to get. Don't miss BMI questions. There's no reason to miss those. It's not that you're going to have to calculate BMI, but they're going to tell you the BMI and they're going to expect you to know what to teach a patient about it. A nurse is providing health education for a client with a BMI of 38.2. All right, let's go back and look at these. So um, under 18.5 is underweight. 25 to 29.9 .9 is overweight. Over 30 is obese. And over 40 is morbidly obese. All right. So under 18.5 is underweight. 25 or over is overweight, over 30 is obese, over 40 is morbidly obese. A nurse is providing health education for a client with a BMI of 38.2. All right, based on what we learned, 38.2 is obese. Morbidly obese is over 40. All right, so obese. Which of the following health risks is associated with this BMI classification? So anything that's associated with obesity. Increased risk of cardiovascular disease, yes, that's associated with obesity. Increased risk of anemia, that's not associated with obesity. Osteoporosis, not associated with obesity. Increased risk of hypoglycemia, not associated with obesity. So the only one that's associated with obes obesity is cardiovascular risk. Client has a BMI of 31.2. The nurse should categorize this BMI as what? So under 18.5 is underweight, 18.5 to 24.5. 24.9 is normal weight, 25 and above is overweight, 30 and above is obese, and 40 and above is morbidly obese. So we've got obese here. The nurse is conducting an assessment on a client with a BMI of 18. What health condition might this client be at risk for? So this person is considered underweight. 18.5 is considered the low end of normal, so this person is considered underweight. So what problems are associated with being underweight? Well, the only one here that's associated with being underweight is osteoporosis. And that's because the idea is that you don't have adequate nutrition. And if you don't have adequate nutrition, then you don't have the essential nutrients. And if you don't have the essential nutrients, the body's going to break down the stores of those things. And one of the stores where they can find calcium is in the bone. So if they have to break down the bones for calcium, you're going to develop osteoporosis. The nurse is educating a client with a BMI of 42. How should this be classified? So I said under 18.5 is underweight. 18.5 to 24.9 is normal. 25 and above is overweight. 30 and above is obese. And 40 and above is morbidly obese. So that's where we this falls. Client with a BMI of 27.5 asks if they are considered obese. The nurse responds, which one is it? Normal weight, no, because that's 24.9. Overweight, yes, up to 30 
is overweight. So that's the correct answer. Client with a BMI of 16.2 has a BMI. How would you classify this? So under 18.5 is underweight. You're right. Which of the fine organs regulates appetite? All right, I forgot I had these questions in here. Which of the fine organs regulates appetite? Unless you know this, I don't know that you're going to get it right. Hypothalamus, y'all. So you need to know that the hypothalamus regulates appetite. A client asks the nurse how the hypothalamus responds to high blood glucose level. The nurse responds that high, blood, high glucose levels cause the hypothalamus to do what? So it's a feedback loop, right? So the hypothalamus stimulates appetite and says, hey, we're hungry. When does it say we're hungry? Well, one of the reasons it might say you're hungry is if blood glucose levels start to go down. Well, here we have blood glucose levels are high. They're going up. So the hypothalamus, if we have this feedback loop, it's going to go, hey, your blood glucose levels are fine. You should not be hungry. So we're going to decrease hunger. Now you might say, well, how does that work? Because if someone's a diabetic, they have high glucose levels and they still feel hungry all the time. The reason they feel hungry all the time with high blood glucose levels is because the cells are starving. The glucose is not getting into the cells and the cell is starving. And there are other ways that those feedbacks can, can stimulate hunger. When the cells are starving, um, it's still going to, it's still going to interpret that as being hungry. So this is someone who has higher glucose levels. When I say high, it doesn't necessarily mean outside normal range, but once you get up to the high normal, that's when it starts to tell, um, the hypothalamus starts to say, Hey, we don't need any more food. All right, my friends, I hope that was helpful to you. Um, that was pretty basic nutrition. That's the name of the video. And that's what it was basic nutrition. So good luck on your NCLEX. If it's a while till you take your NCLEX y'all, you may want to come back and watch this video again later. And I wish you all the best on any tests you're going to take. If you're an RN and you're watching this to remind yourself about good nutrition, this is pretty fundamental. This is it's, honestly, I found that in my practice as a bedside nurse, because nutritionists and dietitians do do a lot of the nutrition counseling. But what I just taught you today is what I need to know to do good counseling with my patients to talk about calorie, losing weight, gaining weight, uh, nutrients, vitamins, minerals, and that kind of thing. So if you understand macronutrients are fast proteins and carbohydrates, carbohydrates are four calories per gram. Proteins are four calories per gram. Fats are nine calories per gram. And you've got the other nutrients of vitamins and minerals, vitamins, the fat soluble vitamins. You don't want to overdose on those. And then the minerals, those are stored in the body in various places and used for a lot of really important things like heart contraction, muscle contraction, and so forth. Uh, nerve conduction, all those things are really important with that. So that's what you need to know to provide basic nutrition uh, teaching with your patients. And I wish you all the best. I'll see you later.